Margaret, do you want to mute? Yep. I can mute you. <laughs> I will open at in like a minute, just. Okay, and then I should just start? I would wait till like, six to start. Like a minute after six? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, all systems go. Okay, it's a minute after six. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good evening. Welcome to the 2022 AIA Baltimore and Baltimore Architecture Foundation Spring Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us for the second, second lecture this evening. Uh, my name is Kelly Dans and I am the lecture series co-chair and I'm an associate at Ziggerstein Architects here in Baltimore. The lecture series is celebrating its 44th anniversary this year. The series brings nationally and internationally recognized speakers to talk about design in relation to a timely theme and draw connections to relevant issues here in Baltimore. The lecture series wouldn't be possible this year without the generous support from our sponsors. <clears throat> I'd like to thank all of our 2022 lecture series sponsors. Major sponsor and partner, Maryland ASLA, Corinthian sponsors, Murphy and Dittenhafer Architects and Shaw Contract, and our Doric sponsors, Blue Ocean, Structura, and WBCM. And of course, thank you to all of our annual sponsors. The theme for the lecture series this year is currently, as we aim to examine the current state of design in light of recent events that have created uncertainty but hope about the future. How do we design to address rapidly changing needs and demands in our homes, workplaces, schools, and public spaces? The 2020, 20, sorry, 2022 AA Baltimore and Baltimore Architecture Foundation Lecture Series will explore current trends and changes in local and international work in the design industry as we look to our post-pandemic future. Tonight's lecture will explore participatory design, placemaking, and public art 
through the work of Rick Summerfield of the Colorado Building Workshop at the University of Denver and multidisciplinary designer Bruce Willen of Public Mechanics and Post Topography. I'd like to introduce the speakers. So Rick Summerfield, Eric Rick Summerfield is an architect, assistant director, assistant professor and the director of Colorado Building Workshop, the design build program at the University of Colorado in Denver. Since founding Colorado Building Workshop in 2009, Rick has built 12 community projects, including 21 micro cabins for the Colorado Outward Bound School, and in collaboration with Design Build Bluff at the University of Utah, five charitable homes and two cabins in Southern Utah. Rick's work with the Colorado Building Workshop and Design Build Bluff has been featured in over 35 publications world, worldwide and received over 40 local, national, and international design awards. He has lectured internationally and the work has been part of exhibitions in Paris, Vancouver, Munich, Vienna, and the US. Bruce Willen is a multi multidisciplinary designer, artist, and the founder of Public Mechanics, a design and art studio working in public space and cultural space. Prior to pub Public Mechanics, Bruce co-founded acclaimed design agency Post Topography, where he led high profile projects that have shaped the visual language, language of Baltimore and beyond. His work has appeared on the covers of Time Magazine, New York Times, ESPN, and in dozens of books and periodicals, including a Post Topography monograph. He is the co-author of the book Lettering and Type and has written for the Washington Post, Design Observer, and other publications. As a musician, Bruce has composed new scores for silent films, performed on multiple continents, and released dozens of recordings with the group Peels and Double Dagger. We welcome both the speakers and thank them for joining us tonight. Uh, please see the AIA Baltimore website for each speaker's full bio. And before we get started with the speaker's presentations, just a bit of housekeeping. There will be a form shared in the chat box for your AIA and ASLA credit. You must fill out the form to receive your credit. Uh, you are also emailed an evaluation form about the lecture and with, with your Zoom information. If you have not filled that out, uh, please fill it out um, at the end of the lecture. And there will also be a, a link in the chat box. You can do it from that link as well. And then at the end of the lecture, we will do a Q&A Q &A session. And you have questions, if you have, you'll be have the opportunity to ask questions for the, to the speakers. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, the specific Q&A box on the Zoom, on the Zoom feature. Uh, we will not look at questions in the chat. Okay, and with that, I'm going to pass pass it to Rick to get started. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, appreciate you, Bruce, giving me an opportunity tonight to present some of the work of Colorado Building Workshop. Uh, Colorado Building Workshop is a design build program at the University of Colorado, uh, Denver. And we really partner with um, communities and not-for-profits, governmental agencies, really to support ideas around um, environment, education, and the arts. Uh, the environmental region in which we're working is really quite diverse, uh, right? in the Four Corners region. You can see our projects are sort of scattered throughout Utah, um, Colorado, New Mexico, and are located in an area that really doesn't have a large population. So most of the projects are very kind of rural. Um, the climate span from high deserts of sort of Utah to the forests of um, Colorado down into rural New Mexico and even up into the Rocky Mountains. And these sort of extreme climates help situate the work, I think, along really sort of interesting topics that the students are able to uh, explore with the clients. We currently are really looking at issues and have explored projects that deal with things like uh, climate change and overfishing, energy use, uh, food deserts, human waste in the backcountry, um, And those projects are done in a very kind of collaborative environment. This is sort of picture of the famous engineer Peter Rice working with Renzo Piano on the d Manil. And I think in many ways, we've tried to set up similar collaborative environments that will allow our students to uh, take on a kind of similar role where we're questioning again and again some of the, the methods and, and ways in which we're building. I think Peter Rice had a really interesting quote 
uh, he said that people say again and again, you have such wonderful projects, but in a way it's kind of what you make out of those commissions that you get that's important. And our, our projects are humble in their beginnings. In many ways, uh, the project typologies and some of the imagery that the clients have given us are things like this. This is our, our starting point um, from things like tough sheds and picnic pavilions to toilets and affordable housing. Some of these are actually prototypes that the people had put together or images that they had sort of shared with us or existing conditions that they were dealing with. But we've been able to study things like thermally broken rammed earth, um, reusing Navajo home kits. We've worked on projects that reflect the environment through the transparency of recycled skyscraper glazing to uh, slow pour concrete. Um, we've looked at kind of integrating into the environment with some of the structures that we've done and studied things like how we increase tourism on Navajo Nation through micro cabins. We've done stages and pavilions for bird banding in remote parts of Colorado, urban farming classrooms to help people start to begin to understand how to grow their own food, to micro housing like the car out or bound cabins in Leadville, Colorado to house staff. Um, we've worked on community projects like Confluence Hall uh, in Moab, Colorado, and then a series of toilets, the Longs Peak Privies in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, more recently, uh, we've worked on some housing for a uh, small startup kind of um, group, or not, not a startup, excuse me, a really long standing group of, um, of adventurers that are, are providing housing for kids in the backcountry in New Mexico. Um, and then more recently, in one of the projects I'll talk about tonight, some secure bicycle storage facilities here in Colorado on the Colorado campus, and then a pedestrian bridge last year. So I think one of the things that drives us, again, to kind of reference the Renzo Piano Peter Rice connection is the link between you know, science and art and trying to distill that down for the students into a series of very digestible um, concepts like context, program, environment, things that you know, really almost every architecture firm is working with and dealing with as core issues. But as opposed to sort of maybe a typical design process that might sort of see these as things to be checked off, we're looking at a more kind of integrated approach where we're identifying an opportunity. Um, really that opportunity is, is, is something that's hidden uh, and I think that's the key and critical term here um, that is interesting in the program that's given. And we're using that and leveraging that opportunity to really try and make the architecture. So as we kind of move into a more innovative design process, we're using integrated project delivery, at least at an academic level, maybe not the same way that uh, you might write that contract commercially, but we're bringing in consultants, we're bringing in the client, uh, we're engaging all parties at the earliest forms of uh, the project to really begin to identify uh, what is important and what is interesting. What are these sort of intensities within each project? And each project sort of varies. So um, tonight, I was just going to take you through a couple of those projects to give you a little bit more information about the detail. And I'll start with maybe the most humble project that we have, which are the toilets on Long's Peak. So. The opportunity really was to leverage the context, material, and structure for a new prefabricated, lightweight, yet heavy enough that it wouldn't be blown over in the wind type of um, urine diversion system that would allow for a healthier way to collect waste in the backcountry. And the trailhead in this particular location is at 9,400 feet, and the toilets are remote. Um, so all of the work that we did down here in Denver to prefabricate those was helicoptered in to sites that ranged from 11,500 feet all the way up to 12,700 feet. And Long's Peak, for those of you who don't know Colorado very well, is one of the famous 14ers um, here in Colorado and is the only 14er in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, and it is a beautiful uh, mountain that's hiked pretty much um, by almost every tourist. Not all of them make it up to the top, but it is one of the most popular trails in Rocky Mountain. Their existing toilets uh, had to be shoveled out with a shovel into five gallon buckets. And then 
the waste was toted down the hill by llamas. This was not a sustainable way for the park service. So we put together um, an integrated team, one person from every member of the park to basically start to address this with the students. And then the students did a really incredible research packet, which allowed them to, um, in many ways, understand the problem at a greater level of detail. They used this research packet thinking about the people and, and building standards, uh, workflow, how the waste system worked, to then create a summary document that started to be something that the Park Service could react to and really sort of showcase how we were going to play off of the history, the ADA accessible toilets. And yes, these are actually accessible toilets at that elevation per Park Service requirements to begin to kind of understand how we would approach the problem. Now for us, uh, a big part of kind of getting into this was the structure itself and utilizing some of the material that was already on the job site, uh, the rock that could be used. And then if the structures were ever disassembled, taken apart, but we wanted to have a minimal sort of impact. So as we went through this analysis of how to thin something like a stone wall and understood the history of other stone structures that had collapsed in that location, we were kind of taken by Neil uh, McLaughlin's quote that architecture is really about continuing a conversation through time and beginning to understand the Gabian cages of uh, Dominus Winery and how Herzog and Muron were kind of using that to uh, this project by RCR architects who won the Pritzker Prize a few years ago. The students began to start to think about a lightweight steel structure that might be able to incorporate that. And in conversations with the Park Service and the engineers, and in an attempt to sort of decrease the thickness of the overall walls, we studied sort of structural models about folded plates. Um, the engineer brought this article to the students, and then we started to think more about how folded steel plate construction worked in Toyo Ito's Serpentine Pavilion. And through an exhaustive sort of analysis of those two sort of systems and how structurally they stood up, we integrated that into a thin, um, basically making the gabion cage from a two foot wall to a one foot wall, laterally stable, steel fin, lightweight structure, where the fins of the structures, as you can see in the upper right corner, line up with uh, identical fin on the opposite side of the structure that are then shifted in plan so that they cross over to create a series of uh, essentially moment frames around a ring truss so that when the wind hits one wall, it actually transfers that load all the way to the other wall. And when the wall is full of rocks, that sort of structure will resist the wind without having to cast giant concrete foundations. So these are really just pinned into a series of boulders that the park service set for us as a foundation. And those fins then really take advantage of the landscape by aligning to views, openings, creating sort of uh, jams for door frames so that the fins are doing more than just handling the structure. They're actually aesthetically creating a, a certain sort of view corridor or trying to be a little bit more poetic. And the engineer allowed us through uh, Excel spreadsheets to begin to understand how much rock we would need in each wall. And the students could sort of plug this in to begin to see where they could do openings. So it was a very interactive collaborative design process that then broke itself apart into four separate pieces along with the floor making kind of the fifth. The students mocked this up at one-to-one -one in cardboard and then in steel, and then ultimately went about um, after kind of ensuring that this worked from the park service standpoint going about the fabrication of it. We prefabricated everything down in Denver, Colorado and had it at full scale without the rocks. These were lightweight enough to be able to transport, be transported by a single helicopter load to each one of the, the sites for the enclosure and then another helicopter load for the waste systems that were in the back. Um, the structural steel is so thin, in fact, that without the support of the rocks on either side, it would have buckled. So we're leveraging the weight of the rocks and the, the thinness of the steel to be able to kind of make this prefabricated system. That was then sort of packed up onto loads and then taken to the site. 
where uh, firefighting helicopters waited till the fire sort of died down in one area and then kind of came through and flew them to the job site. We were supported by llamas uh, and mules to basically set up camp. And then every morning at 3.30, we would get up and hike to the top of the job site. And then the teams individually, uh, and there were three separate teams um, on three sites working on four toilets, went about erecting it. It went better than we expected. We were able to actually erect all of the floor and the walls in about a day and a half, and then spent the next uh, couple of days collecting rocks. And we went down, came back up again, and finished um, in two weeks. So we were actually able to finish the entire project on site in uh, less than eight days, which was, was better than anticipated. So just some final images of how that project turned out. The toilet system is per the park's uh, requirements, a urine diversion system that sends the waste to the back. Um, it diverts the urine uh, out into the site and then that reduces the overall waste and the number of trips that they have to take. And it's all collected in a plastic bag. So it's, it's much better from a park service employee standpoint. Uh, the next project is the Auraria Bike Pavilions. It was a project that we were given by the campus to try and decrease the overall um, theft that was happening to the bikes. We're in one of the highest bike theft areas in all of um, Colorado. And the students really sort of took it upon themselves to make these pavilions for about $100,000 each. So fairly low budget uh, when compared to what it would have cost them to sort of do this otherwise. Um, as, as a series of pavilions that really try and integrate into the context of Auraria, Helmet Yawn, as you can see in the background there, did the library on site with a series of louvers. And those louvers um, are meant to sort of mitigate some of the solar conditions and provide natural daylight. But uh, our group of students wanted to sort of re-envision the louver and the limestone, which is another prevalent material on campus, as almost an extrusion of a parking stripe so that you could begin to park your bike uh, between these louvers that gave us the security and transparency that we were uh, looking for in order to really sort of showcase each bike individually, whether there was space available, and then ultimately provide views into the bike pavilion to kind of look at crime prevention through environmental design. So as a topic, they were kind of considering the idea of how views into the project could be as important of, as somebody parking the bike and their views out. So the louvers quite literally become the parking spots. Um, 45 degree louvers are 45 degree horizontal bike parking spots and, and vertical parking spots um, are hung off of the wall. And sustainability was a really big part of this. So not only were we looking at kind of the sustainability of, of increasing bike transportation on, on campus and decreasing the amount of reliance on fossil fuels in cars, but we also started to look at the idea of how we could create public space, how we could collect water um, off of our CLT roof to begin to take that water down gutters and into um, planting areas. So it was a very holistic approach that the students took to both sustainability, security, and the kind of utilization. And the two different bike pavilions each hold about 50 bikes each. And at certain times of the day, the light actually becomes the parking stripes. The process for sort of doing these stone louvers was a really interesting one. Um, they were looking at dry stack systems and started with brick and then kind of quickly moved on to limestone so that if the building is ever uh, decommissioned, that all of the limestone can be recycled. And as we were going through the way in which we could kind of participate with consultants in this, uh, we were really in an interesting situation because it was 2020 and in March, we all know kind of what hit. And it challenged us in many ways to start to think about how we could rethink um, the idea of mock-ups and collaboration 
and the students took it upon themselves to start working outside in groups. We were delivering materials by car and leaving on porches. They were creating all these crazy videos of cardboard mock-ups in their bedrooms and videoing that out. We were working on Miro. And then eventually in, in the fall, we're able to kind of get back to the build. All of our projects generally happen from design to final completion in 19 weeks. But this year we actually um, took just a little bit more time than that. Uh, we spent um, basically all of March through the summer shut down and working online. And then we geared up again in August, but we were still able to build it within the year. And the students then used the full scale project as a mock-up. The steel fins are both the lateral system. They resist um, the lateral loads and they are the columns. And so these steel fins become not only the structure, but the parking spaces. And the students did a really beautiful job of putting together uh, a whole series of drawings to show how they could dry stack this with stainless steel pins so that ultimately we hope it could be disassembled. There's a little bit of epoxy in there now. And um, you know that was something that we added in a little bit later, but you can see some of the details for that. And then ultimately the manufacturing, they got pretty fast at uh, kind of making that work. So again, participation and collaboration was sort of a huge part of that as they met with stonemasons on the job site and kind of worked to build the project up. And there's some final shots of how some of those louvers work. There's even skateboard parking. And they created sort of custom bike signs, which I thought came out really nice with the LED lights. The next project is um, Lamar Station. It's an urban farming classroom. And you know it was a really interesting project. It's small scale, about uh, $50,000 for the pavilion. And the students were reacting to an existing path that had a core 10 steel bridge along a sort of irrigation ditch. They wanted to create a a sort of classroom that by the client sort of suggestion was transparent um, as they looked into it, but opaque as people walked by, which is a very difficult thing to do. But we went about kind of creating this finite element analysis with the structural engineer and collaborating on how we might be able to use bar grate to create that um, transparency so that as you approach, you can see into the classroom and from that red building, which was their headquarters, you could see into the classroom. So there's transparency there. But as you walk by, it becomes completely opaque. But we didn't want this sort of bar grate to just be this, you know, skin that did that. We actually were looking to incorporate it into the structure. So the bar grate is actually a structural skin that replaces all of the vertical columns and all of the vertical um, parts of the truss to create those cantilevers. So it was a fun structural sort of exercise. The steel plate uh, that you see there is also a truss that collects the water into the washing station and then recycles it into the herb garden. And then the final project that I wanted to share today um, before I talk real briefly about um, just our project that we're working on this year is uh, the car out bound micro cabins. The original sort of prototype for this was a tough shed and they approached me and said, well, we'd like to sort of do housing and we're willing to buy these tough sheds and maybe your students can kind of come in and uh, you know, build us some bunk beds on the inside. And we said, just give us the money and we'll come up with something better than that. So we're really sort of studying the idea of how big can a house be? And especially for these guides, as we talk to them and walk the site, we realize that most of them are happy living in the back of their truck. And that the most important thing to them is actually their gear. So as we looked at the sort of gear as being a really important piece, we understood that we weren't just housing them, but we were housing some of their most prized possessions, which were their bikes, their kayaks, and their skis. And we came up with two different prototypes. The first year we built a prototype on the right-hand side. It was a seasonal housing for temporary staff. 
And on the left-hand side in the second year, we actually built a series of year-round cabins that could be operated with just a single heater on the inside. And the construction typologies were quite different. One was very, very lightweight, protected by this giant shell that went around it with a snow roof. Um, it had no insulation. It was all basically made out of two by fours. The second year, we went with really thick SIP panels that could actually hold the snow on the roof to add our value throughout the sort of uh, winter. And so the project in a very similar way to the ones that I've discussed, you know, was laid out. The students went about building that full one-to-one -one prototype again. This one was inside the architecture school and then, you know, ultimately went out and constructed uh, both the seasonal cabins, which you sort of see here. And then the year round cabins, which were the insulated cabins with the flat roofs that hold the snow a little bit more. They're scuppers that drain the water off. Uh, it's not like we're holding it like a bathtub, but um, we were able to kind of increase the R value quite a bit. And so the interiors have extra beds for when they're in training season, but for the most part, the seasonal cabins um, hold two to three people and the year round cabins usually have one room for each person. Sometimes as little as hundred square feet and sometimes as luxurious as 200, but they all got storage, they all got a desk, they all got a place for their bed. Um, they all had a front porch. A lot of them had uh, little entry areas where you could take your shoes off. And again, this is sort of being done in about 19 weeks. So this year, um, just to close this lecture out, uh, we were approached by NOAA to actually go build their research station in Antarctica. So we're currently um, in the midst of that project. We're out on Cape Sharif, which is on the Livingston Islands, uh, just off the peninsula. And these scientists are studying chin strap penguins and gentoo penguins, along with fur seals and uh, krill. And they're doing that to really understand krill migration patterns in the Drake Passage to understand how much fishing should or shouldn't sort of occur. So this became a very environmentally, material, and contextually a sort of important thing for us as we began to kind of understand that they for the most part, uh, are really struggling with their current facility, not able to do science some days because the paint's peeling, they're getting mold um, inside the building, and overall, the, the field station just isn't doing really well. So we're gonna deconstruct that, um, bring everything by boat, and then in by Zodiac to this landing shore, and that green building in the background is the one that we'll be deconstructing, and we'll be replacing it with a light interference color stainless steel clad building that collects all of the water um, that they need on the roofs and has photovoltaics for their heating and an HRV to ensure that the air that they're getting doesn't have the humidity that it currently does. So this year we're building the dining room and kitchen and then the, the bunkhouse. And then next year we'll do the science lab and a remote emergency shelter in the middle of a penguin colony. But the water, the um, roof gable is shifted to allow for us to use half of it to collect water on one side and the other half to allow for solar. And then um, they can hike that mile to the emergency bird blind if they need to. But we're looking at all of the radio and comms and then understanding how all that duct work is working and how we can increase the storage through more kind of efficient design so that they can have more or food. So if you're interested in the project, feel free to kind of follow us at either our website or our Instagram, but I'm happy to um, share more in the Q&A. And at this point, I'll pass it on to Bruce. Um, hey, hey, everybody. Um, thank, and thanks so much, Rick. Uh, it was so awesome to see those projects. Um, I, yeah, I really love the, you know, all, all the thought that's going into the idea of like deconstructing the, or being able to deconstruct the material and reuse the materials really easily. It's, um, yeah, for, the work is not only beautiful, but it's super smart. Um, 
I, I can't, however, promise you any llamas or penguins in my presentation, but um, I'll, I'm going to share a little bit of work with you today. Um, oh, and I guess uh, before, before I get started, also, uh, thanks so much to the uh, folks at the AIA Baltimore, um, Baltimore Architecture Foundation, and of course, everyone who organized this talk. Um, I know how much work goes into these things. So um, big uh, clap, clap to all of you. Um, so, hey, um, I am Bruce. I am a designer, artist, and musician um, who is uh, based here in Baltimore. And I'm also the founder of the studio's Public Mechanics and Post Typography. So a lot of my work, uh, or most of my work is kind of here at this intersection of experiential design, public art, play, um, placemaking, civic design. And the projects I'm going to share for you today are from uh, this general neighborhood. Um, but before I get into that, I wanted to uh, switch gears and chat a little bit about punk rock. So this is Double Dagger. Double Dagger was the band that I started with my friends Nolan and Denny um, after college. Nolan and I, we were both graphic design majors, and we thought it'd be funny if we started a concept band that incorporated graphic design metaphors into the lyrics. And we even named the band after a typographic symbol. Um, this is the double dagger that is primarily used for sitting footnotes in typography. So a lot of the band's early songs had titles like Command X, Command V, and comic book lettering. But we, we the, kind of quickly evolved. And even though we weren't doing the graphic design shtick anymore, um, the design influence was still pretty apparent in Double Dagger's visual output. When you're a graphic designer in a band, you get all these amazing opportunities to experiment. We created literally hundreds of flyers and posters for our shows, designed all of our own album packaging. Um, this was a EP that we did with these die cut eye holes that changed color depending on which direction you put the CD or the LP in. And coming from this sort of like DIY punk rock background, really influenced the way that I approach design. Um, working within this sort of limited uh, set of resources or constraints is you know, basically what is, defines being a punk band. For one of Double Dagger's tours, uh, for example, um, we'd run out of time and money to print some cool posters and mail them out to people. So at the last minute, we whipped, whipped up this PDF Mad Lib and we sent it out to promoters all over the country. And uh, you know, we just asked them to fill it out with the show information. Um, some of them took it a little more seriously than others. But being in the band also, it, it really influenced the way that I think about how audience experience and can experience art. In Double Dagger, we were really wanting to break down the wall between the performer and the audience and you know, invite the crowd um, to participate in the show if they wanted to remove the stage, sometimes literally. Um, yes, that's, uh, that's actually Nolan licking a crowd surfer's shoe on the right. And the band actually segued into us founding our design studio, Post Typography, in 2007. Since this is a short talk, I'm, I'm just going to really quickly click through a ton of Post Typography's work um, without really talking about it. But when being part of the studio, I think, taught me about some of the things that I really love as a designer, including collaboration, both with other designers at the studio, as well as architects, artists, musicians, photographers, illustrators, as well as experimenting, trying new works, and getting to work on projects that support community and culture. In 2019, uh, Nolan and I, we, we were wanting to go you know, kind of a different direction. And I said, see you later to Nolan. And I started my own studio, Public Mechanics with the specific idea of focusing on projects in public and cultural spaces. And some of these, like, and the types of work that I've been most interested in with public mechanics is doing public art projects, experiential design, 
place making, uh, cultural and community related projects. In starting the new studio, I also have been thinking a lot in the last few years about some of the themes that I, I look for in my work and in the projects that I want to take on. Um, those include projects that relate to play, that relate to cultivating serendipity, that pose questions, include participatory elements. Um, and I've even uh, written a few articles related to some of these topics, and including this one for Design Observer about friction and defending the, the merits of inconvenience in design. And so when I, when I was first asked to do this talk and be part of the Currently series, I, I was thinking about some of these themes in relation to public space. And for me, I, thinking about both physical spaces as well as virtual spaces, I think that a lot of these qualities or like approaches are some of the things that really go into creating engaging public spaces and inspiring people to like do more and enjoy the space the, and interact with each other in public. So one of the first uh, public mechanics projects that gave me an opportunity to explore these themes, including play, participation, um, exploration, is the chairs. Um, this is a public or uh, sculptural seating installation in DC. It was part of a program uh, that they were doing called Playable Art. And the, the idea behind Playable Art is really to create these kind of in-between play spaces that aren't playgrounds per se, but uh, create these spaces for engaging in imaginative or physical play that are outside of the playground. And I, had, I was really fortunate to work with some amazing collaborators on the project, um, including Neighborhood Design Center, um, that's Katrina Carter and Brian e. Hinson, uh, as well as Tim Schofield Studios, who led the fabrication. And one of the first things that we learned when we, we met with the librarians uh, at, at the Anacostia Library, which is where the project was being installed, is that they, there is this real need for additional seating and gathering places and activation within the plaza in front of the library. And you know, taking this like very simple brief as a starting point, I developed this concept that used that took this very prototypical um, sort of chair shape, this uh, almost like dining room chair, uh, like a domestic chair, and uh, twisted it into these kind of surreal takes on a typical chair or bench into these playful sculptural seats. The concept also references neighborhood history. Um, there's, this is a roadside attraction in Anacostia called the Big Chair. So we ultimately developed this suite of 12 different concepts, which we uh, approached or we pitched to the library and brought back to the community. And we did some a series of workshops with community stakeholders, including librarians and some teenagers um, who helped us to choose and revise the design, um, as well as to sort of help us lay out the space in a way that best supported the needs of the people uh, or like patrons of the library. Um, we also discovered that teenagers are extremely uh, particular about color. Um, we got in some heated conversations about the color schemes. And the installation, it ultimately wound up being eight different uh, pieces that are spread across the plaza in different locations. And each of these, uh, the eight different sculptural seats is designed specifically to create these different experiences and opportunities for play and for interaction. The yoga chair, which is doing this fun back bend, um, quickly became, I like, realized it was a favorite of younger visitors to the library. Um, and in fact, within like literally probably less than 30 minutes after bolting this thing into the ground, uh, this like three-year-old like ran over and started climbing all over it. So that was a big, yeah, a fun kind of proof of concept. The skewed chairs, which is, is this kind of a three-dimensional optical illusion that from certain angles looks like an upright chair. And it provides these different opportunities for just for walking around the piece, photography, 
um, more like kind of imaginative play. The seesaw bench, um, which has, it has a fulcrum in the center and is designed that you can play on it with a buddy or you can just hang out and sit on it. The friends chairs, which are these two, uh, two chairs that are interlocked together and the backs are sort of positioned in such a way that the sitters are kind of forced to turn towards each other and converse. Well, I, obviously they don't have to converse, but if they choose to, they can. The pyramid chair, which was originally, we, we'd wanted to make this uh, much taller, but we had to scale it back for liability reasons, understandably. Um, was With this piece, and actually like all of the pieces, it's been really interesting to see and, and watch how the different visitors to the library interact with and kind of find different ways to sit and engage with the chairs. Um, and like one day when I was here, a group of, a, three adults came out of the library and sat on this chair and had this kind of like private business meeting. Um, and, but obviously it's also something that is fun for younger kids as well. The frown bench, which of course is paired with the smile bench. And in the background, you can see the rainbow chair. And this photo was taken from the roof of the library, um, but, but you can see how we kind of arranged the, we, we grouped the pieces in different ways across the plaza to create these kind of discrete sit sitting areas, but also opportunities for um, these kind of like separate play areas for people who are visiting the library. So with, uh, with my background in typography, I'm, I've been like really interested in applying these ideas of exploration, play, friction um, to text signage and language that's the, in the built environment. Um, I'm going to share a few of those projects that sort of, sort of touch on this, including the Waverly W. The, the original brief and scope for this project started off as being a, a more very straightforward sign that was kind of this gateway to Waverly and the Waverly Farmers Market. And we pitched doing something a bit more sculptural with this giant letter W that it was kind of related to the Waverly Main Street uh, branding. And one, one thing that we really liked about this is that you can look at this, sort of view it from different directions and at certain, certain angles it becomes, uh, it's like much more condensed and a very bold letter. And then from other angles, it becomes wide and thin. And I, I kind of like to think of it as this uh, real life variable font um, for all of you type nerds out there. Um, another project that really invites this kind of movement around the, the lettering and typography, um, we were able to, we had the like, pleasure of working on the Parkway Theater a few years ago with Zeger Sneed and the Maryland Film Festival. And there are a ton of opportunities for expressive signage and experiential design throughout the building. We had a lot of fun with it. Um, but one of them in particular, the kind of main branding and signage on the corner of the building also, I think kind of applies this idea of friction and exploration um, related to signage in the built environment. You know, from certain angles, the word, the word is partially obscured. And this kind of light challenge for the audience really encourages the physical movements around the space and create, like adds this physical movement to the actual reading process. And th this is kind of like what, what I mean about friction is sort of not, not necessarily giving the audience all of the answers right up front, sort of give, giving them an opportunity to find their own answer and sort of engage with the, the process in, a, in one way if they feel like it. Um, the sign also, of course, responds to the architecture uh, with the, the location of the building being on this very prominent corner. And the white on white design right, is meant to recede into the, the more like minimalist white box during the day and then light up at night since it's, it is a movie theater after all. Um, the Voxel is another project that we worked on with the Zeger Sneed, which is a black box theater that is also the testing ground for QLab software, which is the industry standard software for running theater technology. 
it's kind of the you know backstage engine behind a lot of stage shows from Broadway to the Olympics. And so we really wanted to think about how the signage, the typography and the, the branding, like everything could kind of express some of this language of theater in different ways. On the exterior signage to the building, we uh, created this very sculptural black cast concrete signage uh, working with loop works that at night is lit in this extremely dramatic way, almost like stage lighting. And in, on the interior of the building, there are these murals that take the hidden backstage language of theater, these stage cues, and turns it into this kind of kinetic poetry that you know, wraps around uh, the, the whole lobby area, as well as into the restrooms. Um, we had a lot of fun with doing some like interplay with the architecture and some of the language, um, and even putting some uh, back, including some backwards text that is meant to be read in the mirror, as well as embossing some of the stage cues into these custom concrete door poles that we also made with LoopWorks. So uh, another uh, more recent, uh, this is a recent installation project, the Library of Lost Gloves and Lost Gloves, um, that also incorporates language, um, as well as some themes of participation, play, exploration, and serendipity in public space. Last year, like during the pandemic, I was taking a lot of walks around, around neighborhood, around parks in Baltimore, and I started kind of like collecting or like or like rescuing some of these orphaned gloves that you see lying sort of forlorn in the gutter or like sad and damp under a, a snowdrift. I've I've always really loved the phenomena of the those single, like the solitary lost urban glove. Um, they have such a poignant quality to them, um, but also I, a lot of personality. And I I really couldn't help but start inventing stories in my mind about some of these lost gloves. Like who, maybe like who are the people who lost them? Who, what's the circumstances? Who are some of the lost loves in their lives? And I added notes to all of these gloves, these little hang tags, where I wrote which, what I was kind of thinking of is the first line of a short love story. Um, and some of these, uh, some of these included things such as I assumed we'd grow together like two old suburbs. Sharp words, soft, soft lips. It was our song, then it was his song. Some of that Romeo Juliet bullshit. And I love how this pairing of the, the found object with a uh, very different text starts to create these opportunities for you know, the engagement of the imagination and delight and you know, like this kind of serendipitous associations. The project also has a participatory element where I, I left a big stack of hang tags at the site along with some markers and pencils and you know, encouraged people to add notes, um, which they did. People wrote some like, funny notes and wrote some of their own poems. I also like was really wanting the project to be kind of this lost and found. And I encouraged people to bring lost gloves that they, they found in the park or nearby and put them here. So maybe they could be reunited with their owners. And so like a, a lot of people brought new gloves, added gloves. Some of the gloves got taken, um, whether or not they got reunited or someone just needed, needed a, their hands were cold and they needed something, I don't, I'm not sure. But, uh, oh, and this actually was uh, somebody found the, what looks like the missing second glove or the missing match to this one red glove. So it's kind of some cool, cool things got added to the installation over time. And I, I loved how like this project, it, it gave me an opportunity to repurpose this very familiar object in a familiar space in this way that um, I, I think, got people to look at the space and the objects in a new way and created opportunities for play and participation. So 
So another participatory project that uh, was a more a client based work. Um, we, for a few years, we worked with the Baltimore Museum of Art on a, a campaign to promote this high profile speaker series um, that focused on themes of art, race, social justice. And the name The Festive of Tomorrow is it comes from a Samuel Delaney es essay that is about the importance of speculative futures. Kind of like taking this as our starting point, we started the project uh, doing quite a bit of writing and kind of imagining, like trying to convey some of this context of the better of a better tomorrow. Like, what would it look like if school teacher was the highest paid job in America? Or, you know, what would it take to get to a place where guns only existed in museum exhibits? And these these optimistic statements really became the center, the, like the centerpiece for this campaign. And in addition, there were, we designed you know, a lot of you know, standard promotional materials, cards, advertising. But the museum also was really interested in reaching audiences beyond the art world bubble. And they, they were open to us kind of like pushing, pushing things further. And, just importantly, being able to spark conversations with the project. The museum hadn't really, I, I think this was one of their first transit advertising projects. So it was really exciting to get some of these like fairly like radical statements into public spaces. They were also like, they were very open and even like, I, I think even really encouraged us to push things further. Um, so we created this series of these kind of detournements um, where these provocative messages or they, they interrupt uh, the sort of signage and advertising that you might find in public spaces. Um, for one event, we even made this fake takeout menu that was stuffed into people's mailboxes. And on the inside of the menu was a, a flyer with information about the event or one of the upcoming events. So these pieces, I, I think they're sort of as much art or maybe more kind of like art than advertising. But the idea was really to like, how can we take some of these themes of the conversation outside the walls of the museum, out, like beyond the lecture hall and in, into public space where people might kind of randomly encounter them. I like to I like imagine each of these as kind of creating these little poetic spaces where people like are given the opportunity to talk or like think about the future. And, and in a way that is not, you know, not the way that we typically are where we're being bombarded, bombarded by the news in a very kind of negative and frantic way every day. The campaign also uh, included this participatory element where we collected people's ideas and wishes for tomorrows, for the future, um, through drop boxes, um, as well as through the, uh, the series website, which collected um, some, some of these phrases. And people were able to kind of vote on some of the ones they liked. And as the series progressed, we took some of these community contributed ideas and we fed them back into the project. And so some of this language actually influenced the future posters and advertising that we developed for the project. So the, the necessity of tomorrow is obviously it was a great collaboration with the designers at our studio and with the museum. But beyond that, it was really a collaboration like or had elements of being this collaboration with the these different communities in Baltimore and the arts community in Baltimore. And I, I think this collaboration really helped enrich that whole atmosphere of the, the series itself and, you know, kind of like expand what they, what this kind of campaign typically would be. Um, just as importantly, I think it allowed people to see their own visions captured in the project. Um, so finally, I wanted to like kind of like wrap up and share also like Rick share a project that is in progress, give a little sneak peek. Um, Ghost Rivers, 
which is a, a project that invites, I'd say like a, you know, a different type of engagement with public space that it, it uses exploration, history, and imagination. And this is a project that really started maybe eight or nine years ago. I'd been looking at this old map of our neighborhood and I noticed on the map that there is this river and a pond that you know, runs, runs down the center of the neighborhood that they're not there anymore, they're, they're gone. And as looking at it, I was like, huh, is this one of those like lost or like underground rivers that I've heard about? Um, like, because I, I wasn't too familiar with it at the time, but they're under Baltimore, like many cities around the world, there are literally dozens and dozens of missing streams and creeks that used to flow over the surface, along the surface of the city. Um, they you know, looked something like this. And now they, you know, 100 years ago, they were buried underground and the same area looks like this. So for the course of this project, um, I've been doing quite a bit of research. Um, this is one photo that, that I've uh, come across that I, I really love because it shows, I think it captures the burial process um, in, in this really clear way. You can see on the right, there's this, this is a creek in Hamden. Um, and on the left, these workers are building this culvert that the river would soon flow through, or I guess it flows through now. And this whole valley got filled in and now there's row houses on top. From a, you know, like a both a design and kind of like a sociological, anthropological context, I'm really fascinated by the, just like the ingenuity of this, uh, of these buried streams, but also the, the kind of hubris of, of it. Uh, obviously, like, you know, taking, taking this very complex system and replacing it with this man-made, human-made, uh, rational, efficient system, it doesn't always pan out the way that we think it does. Um, even a hundred years ago, these underground rivers would occasionally, you know, burst through the banks of the culverts, creating these floods underground, sinkholes. Occasionally that still happens today. Um, these buried creeks, they're, you know, I think mostly forgotten, but they're still very much with us. And if, if you're walking down the streets of the city and you hear the sort of like faint water, like rushing, like coming up from a, from a storm drain, chances are it might be one of these buried streams. So for, uh, there's a, a few different aspects of um, ghost rivers. And this, this is a sketch of, of the project in progress. Um, one of which is going to be uh, the series of these installations on uh, in the public spaces that trace the original path of the stream, sort of showing you know, where it once ran. Um, additionally, there's gonna be a walking tour and some interpretive signage that uh, talks about kind of the, the idea of these lost streams, the ecology of the Berry Rivers or the pre-urban ecology of Baltimore, um, as well as talking a lot about the neighborhood history and the history of Baltimore. I've been conducting a series of workshops and interviews with residents in the Remington neighborhood where the, the project is first gonna be installed. And one of, the, one of the things that's been really interesting when I'm chatting with people is hearing some of their own experience, experiences with uh, buried streams. Um, more, there's a more well-known uh, underground stream in Remington, which is part of Stony Run, uh, goes under the neighborhood. And a lot of people were telling me stories about skating through these tunnels, or in the case of this guy, uh, running, from, running from the cops through the tunnels. And that's really, I think, like one of the things that I love most about public spaces. Um, there's all these different layers of history, community, culture, different ecologies that they kind of like coexist with each other. And typically, I, you know, I think we're just passing through all of these spaces. We aren't generally aren't privileged to glimpse all of the layers. And with Ghost Rovers, I'm hoping to sort of peel back and unearth some of these histories so that people can use their imaginations um, to look into the past, um, as well as to start to see other possibilities for the future. So thanks. And 
let's see. My cursor has disappeared, but I'm going to see if I can stop sharing and turn it back over to the moderator. Or feel free to take it from me if you can do that. I, I can't. Oh, there it goes. OK. OK. So my, my cursor <laughs> wasn't showing up all of a sudden. All right. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, Rick. Um, thank you so much for showing and sharing your impressive work. Um, so now we have a little bit of time for some questions. Um, if anyone has questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we will, I will read them out. I have a question to get us started though. Um, uh, it was interesting looking at your presentations, you know, you're both working on um, these projects in public space, but to me, um, Rick, some of your projects were very remote and Bruce, yours were mostly urban. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about your process for understanding uh, the site and the relationship to the environment um, and how you design for the place. And I just thought it'd be interesting to hear how you do it since the, your sites seem different and if there's similar similarities or differences in your process. Sure, yeah. Um, that's a great question. And it's definitely something that's at the forefront of our mind here in Colorado with this beautiful landscape is that we're kind of given you have to really look at the context. And for us, sometimes it's about a more sort of distant view that you're trying to take advantage of. Other times it's really about um, understanding kind of immediate site conditions. Maybe it's contextually responding to materiality, but it's really very much about this research project that we get into in the fall semester before we start design, a conversation with our clients and then really leveraging what really think um, is the kind of appropriate response based on some of those things. So with the car or bound project, it was very much about the immediacy of the site and the students used trees to kind of guide the entrance that you walk through or windows that sort of looked out at a rock outcropping. Um, so it was a little bit more intimate and something like the Auraria bike pavilions, we were pulling off of the, the louvers from, um, you know, the, the library sort of next door and some of the limestone from the church as a, a way to try and integrate at least the materiality into it, which was similar in Long's Peak. We were trying to make that project somewhat invisible, not invisible enough you couldn't find the bathrooms, but you know, invisible enough that uh, it wouldn't be an eyesore as you were, you were hiking up. So for us, it's really this collaboration between clients and the students and a real dialogue around how we really feel like each project should do it in its own way. There isn't, in my mind, one way to approach that. It's it's really um, very much project specific, if that makes sense. Yeah, I would um, I, I would really second that. I think you know mo most of the projects that, that I work on or work, work on with the, the studio, they're all like very very context specific, and that you know I think that really drives most of the work that that I have done both. Like even the earlier work when I was doing more graphic design work, as well as uh, focusing on work related to public space. Um, but obviously, the last project I showed, the Ghost Rivers project, is is very much based on like related to a specific site and place and neighborhood, and but trying to kind of weave together some of these stories so that it is is very rooted in in place. Um, and you know, similar to Rick, when I like working on more client driven projects, it's, you know, really trying to like understand what are some of the requirements of the, you know, the needs of the client, the project, the um, sort of what what is needed with the site or the considerations with the site as well. Great, thank you. Um, so we have some questions in the Q&A. Um, let me see. Okay, uh, Rick, do you mind answering these so everyone can hear? Um, I'm not sure if anyone, everyone can read when you answer them on the q and A. I'm not sure. Sure, sure. Uh, there was a question about the Herzog and the Muron Winery and yeah, so they there's snakes, and mm -hmm. they did. They they had snakes. They actually tried to mitigate it by um, decreasing the transparency of the mesh at the lowest level, but the snakes were still sort of getting in. The good news in Colorado is that you don't really have snakes at that altitude, which is great. We didn't have to concern ourselves with that. It was something that, you know, we did a sort of an exhaustive research about that. Nobody wants to be sitting on the toilet and watch a snake kind of crawl up underneath their foot. 
but there are marmots and these little pikas. The pikas aren't much of a concern, but the marmots are these kind of, I don't know if you've seen them, fat wombat looking things mm -hmm. and they crawl and fall into the toilet. Um, so we got skulls and we studied the size of the skull and what could fit through and how we could make sure that the vents and everything was small enough for it. And uh, the first day that the project was complete and everything you know, was done, we were sitting around and a marmot crawled up and we were all laughing at the marmot like, there's no way that you're gonna be able to get in. Like we've studied it. And that marmot got right on the outside of the gabion cage and he walked eight feet straight up the wall over the top, <laughs> dropped himself down, walked eight feet down on the inside and kind of was laughing at us the whole way and got inside. Uh, the good news is it's not a vault toilet, which they were falling down into, and then people would get really freaked out because they'd see these like little marmot eyes. It's a very flat urine diversion system, so there's no way for them to actually get themselves, um, you know, back there. Uh, but they were getting along the back. We had put clips with a, a little lock, um, and we'd only done it in the middle, and they were prying their way in to hibernate in the, the winter inside the back. So I did hike up with llamas and a generator and a welder and re-weld some tabs about uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago um, to make sure that they were really, really um, marmot proof and they haven't had problems since. So. Wow. <laughs> Even the research you do sometimes doesn't really work itself out. And so you kind of have to go back and post-occupancy evaluation, right? Figure out how to solve it. Great. Uh, okay, next question. So, um, yeah, so, so the slide, this presentation is being recorded and it, and it will be posted on the AI, AIA website uh, in the future. So if you want to revisit it, you can. Um, and, okay, there's a question. How do you protect the metal from rusting on your projects, Rick? Um, yeah, we do use A606, which is commonly referred to as core 10 steel quite a bit um, versus the A36 carbon steel. Uh, in some instances in Colorado, because the humidity is so low and it's really so salt water, humidity, standing water that rusts, um, we don't rust to failure as quickly as you guys would. It would be a terrible, terrible idea to use A36 carbon steel, you know, along the coast in Baltimore, Maryland, like any of that. But here we can get away with it um, a little bit easier. It does get a patina to it. And then that patina, much like a weathering steel, protects itself to some degree. Uh, it will probably rust to failure eventually, but the plate steel is thick enough that it'll be, those toilets will be deconstructed probably long before we have to worry about that. But I do hike up every year, um, thankfully with the llamas, which is a lot of fun, I'm not going to lie, and, uh, you know, just sort of check them out. Most of the time now, it's just an excuse to go for a hike. Um, they have minor things sometimes that they have us do, and other times we just sort of do it for fun, just to see how they're doing, so. Great, okay, question for Bruce. Um, the underground aspect of the streams, regarding the underground aspect of the streams, how would you suggest bringing the streams to a daylight condition? Yeah, I, that, that's something that is is really interesting, uh, or it's kind of an interesting question. Um, you know, it, it ties back into, I guess the question is like, why, why do we want to do that? Um, so some of the short answer is that these streams have a lot of like, a stream has so many benefits in terms of filtering water, controlling stormwater runoff, um, and not obviously creating habitats. All many, many things that we now we now know about that maybe people weren't thinking about 100, 150 years ago as much. Um, obviously, it's you know in a place like like a that's a very dense city like Baltimore where there is a lot of buildings on on top of them. That's not you know not something that is being considered at the moment, but there are a lot of uh, cities and like urban areas around the world that have started looking at daylighting some of these buried streams. Um, there's actually uh, New York just announced that they're going to try and daylight um, part of Tibbetts Creek in the Bronx, which is a, um, a like a fairly large creek that is mostly underground. Um, and the part, the part of the project that they're able to daylight, I think it runs down a, a decommissioned rail right of way. So there's, I think maybe just enough space where they're, they will be able to uncover the, the creek um, without having to, you know, obviously displace a lot of people or rebuild tons of, like tons of infrastructure. Um, that, that said, it's also like the project, like 
it's I, it seems like it is probably a lot easier to bury the streams that would will be to start to uncover them where it's where it's even possible to. And so, I mean, it's just like it, it's sort of an interesting example of where like we have this technology and the like technical expertise to do something, but then you know without really fully understanding the consequences, and then you know in the future it's like so much harder to to un undo it or to kind of mitigate the situation. But but yeah, I think there there is definitely this growing growing movement towards daylighting streams um, where where it's possible and where the kind of conditions permit, like all over the world. Great, thank you. Another question for you, Bruce. Um, the project with all the seating. What were what material were the chairs made out of um, to make them durable enough for kids to play on? Yeah. So the the chairs are are steel, and it is a that. Um, is a permanent installation in in the plaza. So, the the idea being that, yeah, this is this is something that is also going to be maintained by the um, library staff as well. And um, they, um, it's the the project is owned by as part of like the the city of DC's art collection as well. So there's kind of a maintenance plan for it. And like assuming this pro these chairs are going to be like well used, probably get graffiti and all sorts of stuff. Hope probably skated on we some of some of them I think would be really fun for skaters um yeah we wanted to design them in like a really durable material but also with um in in mind that they could be repainted and maintained great okay and a question for both of you do either of you do post project surveys or interviews about people's experiences with the project or place um I can yeah I, I can start or, or be the first one. Um, I say sometimes with some projects, yes. I I say more typically. I mean, depending on the project, um, it's often more anecdotal kind of interviews and discussions. Um, if there's a project that has kind of the scope or budget to do do a more kind of formal survey or interview process, um, I it's it's great to be able to do that. Um, and with the Ghost Rivers project, that's something that I'm you know, planning for in terms of increasing awareness of, of the topic. But I, I always like to follow up after the project, just like anecdotally with both like the clients and, you know, sometimes people in the community and just, just be like, hey, what, what do you think of this? What, how is this working? And I, I feel like I always learn, you know, learn something. There's always like some surprising answers. There's always something that's like, oh, yeah, I, I didn't think of of that kind of interpretation, but that's cool that you are understanding it that way. Yeah, we, we do actually do it, um, and I do it for educational purposes. It's almost uh, important as part of the learning process. So I take the group of students that's going to be doing the next project, and I have them do a post-occupancy evaluation of the project that was just finished. Um, it serves a number of purposes, and I don't know that it's as scientific as it could be, and I probably need to get a little bit better at it, but it generally tries to have interviews with the client or people that are using it. It tries to interview um, the consultants that we've used in the past and the students in the past. That creates this sort of alumni network between years where the last year's group becomes mentors for the next year's group. And then that group that's kind of going in can give feedback to the group that just finished so that they can kind of reflect on the work that they're doing. So it does become a bit of a cycle. Some years, some projects are better with the post occupancy evaluation than others. Obviously, in places where you have cabins that are being lived in and people that you can interview, um, you know, or a bike pavilion that you can actually go uh, visit, it's a little bit easier, um, you know, to do. And then some of the other stuff, like Bruce mentioned, is a little bit more anecdotal. You know, you hear people talking about the toilets or they show up on Instagram and that's always, you know, quite validating or the park service employees talk about, you know, um, their durability and how much they actually do like them. But most of our projects aren't all that easy to sell in the first place. So that becomes really important because a lot of people are very skeptical about like the toilets, like, are, are we really going to want something like that uh, and so it's always validating when they work out really well and you have a kind of proof of concept in the one-to-one -one mock-ups and then ultimately like the proof that the public is responding to them in a positive way which ultimately i think led us to like the noah project where 
Noah's reaching out to us and saying, can you come down to Antarctica and do a project? I could have never dreamed of that like 10 years ago, but in some ways the, the students and their kind of success in, in thinking about occupancy um, and the success of it, along with the research question, um, has led us to some pretty incredible opportunities. Really feel fortunate for that. Great, thank you. Uh, anyone else have any more questions? Uh, we have a few more minutes, but uh, I have a question for both of you. Um, so what do you see uh, changing or what, have, what has changed uh, in your process through the pandemic? Yeah, I can start. That's a really good one. Um, you know, there are things that we have carried over. We were forced to use. So from a uh, communication and collaboration standpoint, uh, we kind of moved more robustly into things like Bluebeam and uh, Miro so that we could coordinate with um, some of our consultants. We also obviously, like everybody else, started using Zoom. And I really hated it in the moment. And I think upon sort of further reflection and some of the students being used to some of those forms, we found that Miro is a really wonderful way to communicate with the client. Instead of a presentation, we can post stuff on the board. We can send it to them a day or two ahead of time. They can come through it. They can leave comments. We can go back and forth. So we've been using Miro a lot with NOAA. They're in San Diego. The fisheries is in San Diego. We're working on a project obviously in Antarctica it's become incredibly useful. Um, Zoom sometimes actually when you're doing uh, like a presentation or red lines to be able to share your screen and all the students can get as close as they want to that screen has been you know, really helpful as well. And um, I think that kind of collaboration and trust. Uh, so around tools, I've seen things change you know, considerably. Um, and then just in terms of the way in which we treat each other, I just feel like there's a lot more understanding and compassion that's kind of come out of this in terms of how everybody works and the way in which they feel comfortable working um, that it's brought about. So, you know, in those ways, there are some kind of positives that I've seen from a collaborative standpoint that kind of have come out of that. Yeah, I think that that last point, Rick, was really, is really true. Sort of, I think having everyone hopefully now has a little bit more empathy for all of the like stuff that ever, like people on your team are going through, like trying to deal with childcare or a sick relative or who such and such. Um, and, and just like understanding, you know, especially during the pandemic, like no, nobody's having an easy time right now. And so that, that I think um, was really great. Um, and, you know, I, I agree, but similar to Rick, I think just sort of embracing more kind of, digital tools for sharing and, and trying to communicate with people that working on some projects that have a ha, have had a big community engagement element in the past two years has been really difficult because um, it's obviously it's so it's so much easier to connect with people in person and I I don't know that any of the online tools have like, like come close to, to replicating that. Um, you know, I think definitely being able to like relying on more things like sur surveys and, uh, you know, you're trying, trying to give people opportunities to respond in different ways digitally to, for like engagement stuff has been, been cool. I've, got, I've done some stuff with Miro as well. Um, but, but yeah, just being, luckily I think, once we found it was like safe to do some, you know, some kind of limited engagement outside, it definitely has made it a lot easier to, you know, talk with people about projects, get their feedback, do interviews and things like that. Um, I, I guess I like also add that one, one really cool thing about the, the pandemic for a lot of people is that I think it has really refocused them on the, the value of public space right now as, you know, it's like suddenly everyone is spending a lot more time outdoors, like in, in parks or like going on walks in the street. And there is, I think there's this kind of like reaffirmed commitment, even for people who aren't like heavy advocates for public space are like, oh yeah, parks are really cool. Plazas are really cool. Being able to 
go sit at an outdoor cafe is is really important to me. So that that is something that I think it definitely is something that has come out of the pandemic that I feel like is sticking and is going to create a lot of benefits down the road. Great, thanks. Yeah, I agreed. <laughs> uh, it's interesting to hear you both answer that. Okay, are there any more uh, questions? There's just a comment. Uh, great work, Rick and Bruce. Thoughtful, compelling, impactful, and beautiful. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, we can move to the closing slide. Um, so thank you. A uh, big thank you to Rick and Bruce for participating in the series this year and to continuing to make this our lecture series a success in this digital world. Um, and once again, thank you to our 2022 Spring Lecture Series sponsors and to our annual sponsors. Uh, and again, all the lectures can be found online uh, at aiabaltimore.org. And then please don't, fill out, don't forget to fill out your form for credit and the evaluation form. So thank you all so much for joining the AIA Baltimore and Baltimore Architecture Foundation uh, tonight for the Spring Lecture Series currently. We appreciate your continued support as we continue in the digital sphere, and we hope to see you in person soon. Thank you all. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, thanks Kelly. Well, thanks, Rick. Thanks, thanks, Kelly. Thanks, everyone.